Hello, everyone. This is Doris from Anchor. We are getting ready to start off our virtual town hall. Today, we'll be joined by two speakers. We'll have Chris Sparks from Exceptional Persons Limited. Um, and Chris was started at EPI in 1991. He is an Iowa native. He became the executive director in 1998. He served in anchor in leadership roles over 15 years, and he will be joined by Katie Slade, his orga organizational development director. So before we, st we start, as you've seen, I've changed the screen to um, have a, a little bit of housekeeping. If you can't hear me, make sure your computer is connected to the speakers, that your volume is turned up and not on mute. We have a phone number on the screen that you can call and we'll answer questions at the end of the session. Shortly after the uh, webinar, we'll put up uh, the slide on the ACC where you originally registered um, so you can download them. Um, so with that note and that introduction, I am now going to hand things off to Chris so he can start discussing the virtual town hall that we think is actually an excellent model of advocacy. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, just by way of introduction, uh, I will tell you that as we got our thoughts together for this activity, I really thought some about the fact that Anchor is uh, filled with members who are really are wonderful public policy advocates and who are really pros. They've been doing this for a very long time. And so I am I'm not sure we're going to say much that uh, is going to be new information for people. So we will we're, we'll happily cover the details of our virtual town hall, and uh, then there will be time for questions. So uh, you can certainly get more specific or ask for more explicit information, and we invite you to do that. And, and as uh, Dora said, I am joined here by Katie Slade. Uh, not only do, was Katie responsible for troubleshooting the technology that made the virtual town hall possible. Katie is also the manager of all of our communications, which means that she's primarily involved in crafting message and structure for this kind of activity. So she's very appropriate to uh, uh, ask those sorts of questions. So without further introduction, I will tell you that on June 6th, we did hold a virtual town hall with United States Senator Charles Grassley. And that was actually uh, specifically, purposefully in conjunction with Anchor's fly-in that was held that very same day. And you will remember that that fly-in was designed to bring a, really a concentration of people to D.C. Uh, and to meet with their senators in response to the American Health Care Act legislation, the, the AUK legislation that became the uh, uh, BCCR legislation that became the ORRA legislation that ultimately became the skinny repeal legislation, none of which passed. But at that time, it was the ACA legislation. And so we really thought about that. And we recognized that we have some limitations. Travel to DC from Iowa is not really convenient. It's costly from a monetary standpoint, and it's costly from a time standpoint. And so I knew that that was going to pragmatically limit the number of people we could get to D.C. and into the offices of our senators. That was a difficult uh, thought process for me because I really like traveling to D.C. and I really enjoy uh, going up to the Senate offices and meeting in person with our members. But uh, we really stopped to think about the fact that the objective of this exercise was really to engage a large number of people. So we decided instead to explore the option of creating a virtual town hall. Really simply, here's what I envision. I envisioned a room full of people, carefully selected people, that would be interacting live with our senators through a video feed. So the first thing I did is ask Katie, uh, who uh, then extended that ask to our IT staff, if we even had the technology to do it. How hard would it be to do this? Uh, they were able to determine very quickly that it wouldn't be hard at all, of course, after that, I pitched the idea to Senator Grassley's health policy director, a lady named Dr. Karen Summer. And I did that all before Memorial Day. That becomes important. We're going to circle back around to that date with regard to scheduling. And uh, I got a response from Karen Summer very quickly. It was a Friday afternoon. I remember it explicitly. And she responded very enthusiastically. Uh, so we began to put the 
the plans in place to accomplish that. Now, it's important to note right here, had she been lukewarm in her response, that probably would have changed our trajectory, and we might have altered our plans, but we got a very good response from her, so we moved forward. Um, we started with Senator Grassley. Of course, we, have, uh, we, we considered our other uh, state senator, um, Senator Joni Ernst. We always start with Senator Grassley uh, in terms of scheduling. Uh, candidly, we give him preferential uh, scheduling position. He's the senior senator from Iowa. We've got a very, very long relationship with him, and uh, he is interested in what we do, and his staff likewise are interested in what we do. So we always give him preferential scheduling. But when we reached out to Senator Ernst, we always uh, suggested that we'd like to get them uh, in both in a virtual town hall and that these, uh, these times would be subsequent to one another. Um, scheduling was a challenge, and we worked at it pretty consistently, folks. Uh, I reached out to Karen Summer a couple of times when I felt like we just hit our log jam, and she did some pushing behind the scenes. I am confident this would not have happened had we not done that. Even so, we did not get confirmation of the Senator's participation until Saturday, June 3rd in the afternoon. So think about the dynamics of that schedule. We started before Memorial Day, got final confirmation Saturday, June 3rd. That, of course, created some log logistical challenges for us. Uh, Katie and I had talked uh, on an ongoing basis, what are we going to do? And so what we did is we assumed the activity was going to happen, and we put out a placeholder invitation to the kind of people that we would want to have attend. Uh, additionally, given the state of town hall meetings at that time, and probably now as well, we were really clear at promising a disciplined and respectful exchange. That's the language I use very consistently. And because we've got an established relationship with the office, they knew that they could trust that. But that was an important uh, point. We asked for and received a half hour of Senator Grassley's time, and then we worked to craft our message. We were thoughtful about the message, and we, we were really clear on what our desired goals were and what the structure of the event was going to be. That's critical. We had our participants gather about 30 minutes before the event, and we used that time to prepare them and to set expectations. That was really our time to educate them, to make sure that we could manage the event, that they understood their role, and I think that's really important uh, in terms of preparation. We started with introductions, thank yous, pleasantries, and then we moved to general concerns about the uh, American Health Care Act, and then specifically we drilled down on the impacts of Medicaid per capita caps. We gave Senator Grassley as much time as he wanted, and that turned out to be about 15 minutes, although we did get 30 minutes of his time. And we placed him on the agenda where the staff requested. We sent a draft agenda to uh, Karen Summer, and uh, she explicitly uh, requested a, a certain position on the agenda. And, of course, we placed him there. And we used our – we after his statement, uh, we dedicated time to questions and answers. And we used our participants quite strategically. For instance, we have a board member who is the father of a person who uses our services, so we gave him the workforce question. Our state association director asked a question about base year flexibility and illustrated how problematic uh, FY 2016 would be for Iowa. So we really used the questions to further our concerns about that legislation. We, we never did get Senator Ernst scheduled into a virtual town hall. We got 30 minutes of her time on the phone later, and we worked really hard to replicate that event with her, just couldn't quite get it nailed down. And I attribute that to the fact that her health policy director had turned over or gone to Senator Thune's office, actually. Uh, shortly prior to that, I think if she would have still been in place, we probably would have been uh, successful. So that's really the broad uh, outline of what we did. And, and uh, Doris, I'll take a breath and, and uh, turn it back to you. Thank you, Chris. So the big question that everybody on this webinar is probably asking themselves is why is this worth the expenditure and the time for you? Um, and the fact of it is, especially with the health care bill, I won't say dead, but for at least comatose for the time being, we have a respite. We have time to build more bridges, especially since Congress doesn't really quite yet understand how important Medicaid is to our field in particular. Um, 
So it's a time to build bridges. It's also a time to reinforce trenches. Um, Medicaid will be back on the agenda at some point this year. It will probably come back and chip reauthorization, um, but there are other legislative vehicles. The more you talk to your members of Congress now, the more they can't say they didn't know what this was uh, or that they didn't really understand the full impact of their consequences come the time for another vote on a different forum. Also, this is a great tool for you to use in general. It doesn't have to be for members of Congress. Um, we saw the importance of governors in this whole discussion. Um, this could be a way for you to connect with your state legislators also if they don't want to travel. It's a great tool for you to develop into the future. Um, so that's why, Chris, if you've caught your breath, I'm going to pass it back to you and transition to the next slide. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, uh, certainly. Um, so uh, Doris is absolutely correct. Uh, the stakes have never been higher. And if you are a seasoned uh, public policy advocacy pro, great. Uh, you, you know what to do, and, and you know that we have to be consistent. Uh, maybe you're just um, uh, entering into this arena and it, you're just getting involved. What a great time uh, to get involved because this Medicaid discussion uh, is absolutely critical. In fact, one of the things that we learned, uh, one of the things Senator Grassley stated uh, during the virtual town hall as we were expressing concerns uh, in general about Affordable Care Act repeal and replace and then talking explicitly about Medicaid, Senator Grassley hastened to point out that no decisions had been made at that time. Of course, that was true. And then he made the statement that I found really interesting, did not surprise me. He said, the only conclusion I have reached is that this open checkbook for Medicaid has to come to an end. Well, that was, uh, that again, that did not surprise me. I'd never heard him state it quite like that. But we need to understand, Senator Charles Grassley, moderate Republican, and a person who's really interested in what we do, and yet this is his declared position. Uh, so will entitlement reform and Medicaid reform specifically return to the, to the general discussion? I think we need to be confident that it will. And uh, Doris is right. This is a respite for us to... Uh, um, engage uh, in a different kind of conversation that is preparatory to that particular activity. So how, what do we do in this little bit of a time period, in this little bit of lull? Uh, building relationships with your elected officials is absolutely key and critical. I argue uh, this to groups of people. If you want to have a career in, in the social services, you have to be involved in public policy work. All funding, all regulatory guidance flow to us out of legislative action and administrative implementation. So if we think about it in a very real sense, everything we do is public policy, on a, certainly on a federal level and on a state level as well. And what we do is we work to favorably influence public policy on behalf of our constituents. So how do we do that? Uh, we've done a number of things. I think it's critical that you educate them about your organization and more importantly about the people who come to your organization for services. And we always work to illustrate superordinate motivation. Uh, we always look, and what I mean by that is we always try to shift focus to the bigger picture. It's all about the individual, in this case, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, we can talk about the organization. We can talk about staff. We should. But it's not about me, it's not about the organization. In the eyes of the member, uh, the most important person in that particular conversation is always going to be the Medicaid member, the person that comes to the organization for services. And so it gives us a beautiful opportunity to illustrate the impacts of services and why they're so critical. And, and to tell them specific stories about people who have, whose lives have been made much better and they, they've had inroads into the community by virtue of the services you offer that have been uh, funded by Medicaid. Um, we always work to have regular and goal-oriented contact with the member and with staff. What does that mean? Just you, we need to be consistent in our contact and we need to, we need to 
make sure that we have a larger goal in mind. What are we working to accomplish? What do we want this exchange uh, to accomplish? What, are, what would we want the key takeaways to be? How might we communicate this key part of our message? And the consistency element is very important. So we work to schedule a regular in-person time, uh, both in DC and when the member is back in the state. Ironically, we've had an easier time scheduling in-person time in DC because the member schedules are so full when they're back on recess and there's, there's so much that they're working to accomplish, but we still work at both of those things. And we supplement that in-person contact by email and telephone contact. All are effective and we should avail ourselves of all of those methodologies so that we might have an impact. Uh, my advice is don't be discouraged by scheduling challenges because they're real and they're pervasive. And always meet with whatever staffer that shows up, no matter how young or how obviously inexperienced on our issues. And you will find uh, when we will be coming to DC in September for uh, the Leadership Summit. And we will schedule visits with both of our Senator's Office and with a number of uh, representatives. And we will go from meeting Senator Grassley and his health policy director to probably meeting with a very young staffer in one of the representatives' office. We need to bring our A game uh, to any of those visits. Now the message needs to be tailored and we might need to do more introductory work with that young staffer, but every meeting is important and we treat them as that. Uh, in terms of what you need to do, have good information, have a, and current information as much as you can. So have good information, have a clear and compelling ask, what is it you're going to request of them in that particular visit. And I will tell you that Anchor and our GR leadership group, we always work to answer that question on your behalf. What is our clear compelling ask this time? So we will, we will in all likelihood prep you uh, before those visits, and you should look to uh, anchor with that expectation. But all the, this uh, extends to all contact that you have. What is your clear and compelling ask? And have your facts straight. Now, I will tell you, I always work from notes. They may not be uh, typed. They may be hastily written on a three by five card, but I always create structure, and I always have the key points that I want to remember. Uh, you don't have to be an expert, but you do have to know what you're talking about. And I suggest that you work with colleagues from your state. We have done that for many, many years and found that to be a rich experience and it's extraordinarily helpful. So we worked with a number of providers and our state association exec uh, in Iowa and when we attend anchor activities. When we're out in DC, we schedule and attend those visits together and the person who has the best relationship or uh, who's represented by the district in the, uh, in the case of uh, the House members takes the lead in those visits. It's been very effective. So, and invite colleagues to activities in the state when the member staff will be present. In fact, I was at an activity yesterday that a colleague of ours arranged in Dubuque and she invited me and a number of other people and so uh, it gave us another opportunity to work together with that House member. And finally, work very, very hard on relationship building. This is an exercise in relationship building. Sorry, Doris, that was, a, that was an awkward transition. Back to you. <laughs> That's absolutely fine, Chris. Um, so we're going to shift now more into the logistical components. I now open a slide that shows you the tools you will need. Um, we're leaving the slide in here when you download it, so I'm not going to dwell a very long time on it. The key point I want to t transmit with this um, slide is that it only really takes about two people to set this up. Um, somebody who's familiar with technology to the extent that they know how to use um, cameras on their computer, and then somebody who can help them test by being further away in the room, for example, so you can see camera angles and whatnot. Um, so it's a fairly simple setup. Most of your computers will actually come with these things set up, though we did list some alternative for things you might not um, have on older models. Katie, is there anything you want to add? 
Thanks, Doris. Yeah, I, there's just three things I think that I want to add here. Um, the first is with the computer. Um, make sure your computer is up to date with all of the updates they have going on. Sometimes, this has happened to me right before a meeting, that your computer will force a restart. This is not a good time for that to happen. <laughs> so you may want to just check and make sure your computer is up to date on that. Um, second, with the speakers, I know laptops come with speakers. But if you're in a large room, really, really consider doing some external speakers. Otherwise, your participants in the room are not going to be able to hear what your um, legislator has to say. So really consider either investing or borrowing some speakers that will just enhance the quality there. Um, and then the last thing, I think it's helpful to know what your legislator needs on the other side. If you're going to pitch this to, um, when we pitch it to Senator Grassley, um, they actually have some video conferencing equipment there. So they used a television that they had already set up. But if you're going to do this maybe with a state senator, they might not be as um, technology um, minded. So you may want to just let them know they can do this from their office, at their desk, with a laptop, as long as it has a camera and a speaker. It, so it can be so easy for them to, to do. So it's just helpful for you to know on the other side, they don't need anything fancy. All they have to have is just be sitting at their desk with a laptop and they can do this online video chat with you. That's all I have. Great. So now we're going to seek into the actual program that was used. Um, Senator Grassley's staff used join.senate.gov, which is their own internal tool. Um, so it would be worth it for you to check with your senator's staff if they use that. If not, at, in the appendix, which we won't really go over on this presentation, but you can access afterwards. Um, we did list two alternative options. Um, and within the appendix, we also link to instructional uh, videos that they have and just resources so you can learn how to use them. But they're very common video conferencing tools. You basically create a free account, and it gives you multiple options. And as long as you have an internet connection and a phone line, you can use them. Katie, do you want to add anything before I move on? No, I think you just said a really important thing, though. Make sure you have a strong Internet connection. So um, I know we had it in the last slide, but sometimes the Wi-Fi will drop, and you may not be aware of it when you're just working at your desk. But when you're on a video stream, it will drop the whole video stream most likely. So um, if you can be like hard hardwired into your Internet, that might be the best way to go. And so another thing to keep in mind is the blind spots that a camera has. Um, anything that's behind and a bit to the sides won't show. So that's something to keep in mind when you're testing the uh, room beforehand um, to see where the blind spots are so that you can set up your chairs. And you know, we, I replicated the EPI setup with this, but if you have a smaller group, you can also just move the seats around, so a half circle. Basically do what makes sense for the crowd you have and the space you have, um, but keeping in mind the blind spots. And so for that... The other thing, Doris, it's really important to consider, and it is uh, what, what image do you want to convey to the member while you're doing this? And so we thought about that. I mean, we don't belabor it, but we sweat some of these details, and we just asked ourselves what we wanted them to see as they were looking back at us and we arranged the room accordingly. Uh, and, and then in our testing, we made sure that uh, um, the, the participants could be seen. So it's, I, I just want to illustrate that that's not a small thing. And you could very inadvertently communicate something that you didn't want to by not attending to that detail. Uh, specifically, I would, not, I would not host a video conference from my office. My office has uh, it is not tidy, and there are too many stacks of work in progress. It's simply not the image I would like to convey. So, uh, you know, you don't want to you, you don't want to overthink every aspect of this and, and psych yourself out and make it feel impossible. It's not. It really was, except for the scheduling, it was not difficult at all to arrange. But do remember when you do this, it's not unlike an in-person visit. It's not unlike a telephone conversation. You really need to manage every detail of this because all of those things matter. And sometimes it's the small things that can have a larger impact than we might want them to. Thank you, Chris. That's a great contribution. Um, so we're seeking now to find logistical tips. Um, 
the key points are that there might be a small delay in the feed and to do a lot of testing, but I am actually going to hand this over to Katie um, for her insight. Yeah. So there, there absolutely can be a small delay in the feed, and that's just you know due to the bandwidth and, and the video packaging traveling across the Internet waves. Um, so just be prepared that you might ask a question, and you just need to kind of sit tight for a little bit. It's just going to take them a little bit longer to hear your question and then reply. So, um, so give it a little bit longer pause than you normally would in face-to-face -face conversation. Um, they're going to get your message. It's just going to take a couple beats more than normal. Anything you would add to that, Chris? Well, and, and that we, picked that, we picked that anomaly up during the test. Mm -hmm. uh, we tested the day before, and for whatever reason, uh, the day before there was a delay, and it was a pronounced delay. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, so much so that in, when we got our participants ready in that half hour prior to the virtual town hall, we just let them know, hey, there is a, there's a pronounced weird delay, and we just need to be prepared for that. Uh, and, and it, oddly, the day of the virtual town hall, things work flawlessly. Mm -hmm. It was instantaneous. And so what I would say is it could be that or it could be a hundred other little glitchy things that you just need to be prepared for. Yeah, yeah. So like Chris said, our, our tip to you is test, test, and then test some more, and definitely in advance. So we started out testing just our equipment to make sure that we could get sound to come through, you know, all of the pieces we're using, making sure our video worked, making sure our internet was reliable. So we did all that internally, um, and then we went ahead and tested with the um, senator's tech staff there. And we had to do that twice, actually, because when they switched the software, we originally proposed using um, a different software, unknowing that they had a software system that they wanted to use. And so when they proposed that, of course, we jumped on whichever was easiest for them. So that shift caused just enough of a glitch that we had um, a few complications that we had to work through. They were easy to work through, but we did do two tech um, testing with the senator's staff, and they were very accommodating, very, very nice about that. So, so I would just say, yeah, make sure that you're testing, and especially if you borrow someone else's equipment, build in a couple time frames to test, you know, maybe in your office, then in the space that you're going to be using for the live event, uh, and then with the, the staffer, whoever the tech person is, it's going to be on the other side of the the call. And then the second thing Chris also kind of alluded to too, there are just little glitches that can happen. So, um, you know, if you're able, have a few backup things in place. Um, it could be a backup laptop, could be backup a cable, um, a backup internet source. You know, you just never know what's going to happen in that moment. We had so much as, you know, plan A, plan B, and even plan C, which was, okay, the video doesn't work and we're going to have to conference call in. And so we had a conference phone there and um, phone numbers and ready to go that route if we needed to, knowing that we wanted to honor the time that we had with the senator and the, the folks in the room. So that Great. is, yeah, Great. those were our tips, I yeah. think, yeah. So now that we've you know, talked about what to do, let's talk a little bit about messaging. Um, you know, the key point of all these events is to put a human face on a fairly intangible issue in a way. You know, we're taught Medicaid is this big, vast bureaucracy. A lot of government staffers regularly confuse it with Medicare. Um, so in the space of like, this program that people don't understand, like making it a human experience is really important. The virtual town hall is a way of putting a human face on something. Um, so we have some messaging points in the appendix that you can look at later that are general. This is why Medicaid is important. But one of the things in the aftermath of the health care bill as you reach out is to consider how to target your message. So th there were senators on both sides of the aisle who opposed the bill from day one. Um, and you know, those deserve some special thanks, as well as some other groups that I'll transition to shortly. There are also senators who expressed concerns. They were not necessarily you know, at liberty to break with their party, but they understand the importance of Medicaid and they thought about it. And they're going to be prime targets in whatever the next round is. And there are also senators who you know, supported the health care bill for a myriad of reasons, be it fiscal conservatism, be it having made promises for year after year after year to repeal Obamacare. Um, regardless of that, even if they voted for provisions in Medicaid that were not necessarily friendly to our population, it's still important to educate. Um, 
and to reach out and to start building those bridges. Um, so just hey, Doris, something. you know, you do you mind if I, here's the comment I would add to that. Um, we, we really knew uh, from the beginning that it was quite likely that both of our state senators would vote in favor of whatever ACA repeal and replace legislation ultimately was put before them. Now, I will confess I found that maddening, but we have to understand we probably weren't going to change their fundamental position. So what we accepted as our responsibility is to work very hard to educate them, and as a citizen of the country, we had some broad concerns about what happens to the number of uninsured people and what happens to essential health benefits and what happens to people with pre-existing conditions. And just as a matter of conscience, I felt like we needed to share those every time. But then we spent the bulk of our time working them through the implications of structural Medicaid reform and what happens to people who've traditionally relied upon that as a funding source and explicitly, in our case, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we knew we probably weren't going to move their vote, although we did get to the point where we asked them explicitly to vote no. You have to ask for what you need and what you want, but we were always respectful about that and we were always educating them about the unintended consequences of Medicaid reform with great up-to-date information uh, based on modeling uh, um, given the growth rates that were being proposed, the, the federal growth rates that were being proposed in each of those legislative options. So you may know where your member stands on an issue, and that's very helpful information. It helps you not get into an um, a unpleasant confrontation or a conflict, but you can still work very hard within those understood boundaries to try to have an impact. Great. Thanks, Chris, for um, specifying that. Um, it, it, it's always good to have that backup strategy and, you know, the bigger picture that can be tied into, even if we don't always see eye to eye on a specific issue. Um, so we've listed here, and you can come back later to look at these, the list of senators that, you know, we do want to thank um, Democratic senators, independent senators, Republican Senators Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski really, like from day one, were allies. Senator McCain ended up being the final vote against the health care bill. Um, but then it's also important to note that while they're not getting as much of, a, of attention from the media, there were senators who voted against the initial amendment, against the, full, the first Senate version of the health care bill, which was a terrible bill which means these senators are going to be key targets in future campaigns. So you know, again, even if they didn't meet us all the way, they did small steps, and it's important to cultivate those relationships and show appreciation for that in the future. Um, so that's the core of our content. Um, we do want to give you time for questions from anything um, from the technical aspects to the policy aspects. Um, while you think about your questions, I'm going to very briefly just show you what is in the appendix. Um, and I see that one of the questions has already come in as to whether the recording of materials will be available after the meeting. Um, yes, they will be. It might take us a couple of days, but when you go into the um, Anchor Connected Communities side, there sh you should have a community that's just for people who registered for the webinars, and within the library, you will find the slides. And so the extra slides, while you think about your questions, um, and remember to type them into the box so that we can see them, we have talking points about Medicaid. We have how links to a template um, that we made for meeting requests that can be very easily changed to a video conference request. Um, and then we have links to tutorials for additional conferencing tools if the offices you're reaching out to don't have a Senate tool or some similar uh, mechanism of their own. So that being said, do we have any questions? As a reminder, please use the chat function um, if you do. And we'll give it a couple minutes. While, while people are thinking about questions, uh, I, would, I would just make uh, two other points, Doris. 
uh, I, I illustrated this, but when it comes to scheduling, when it, becomes, when it comes to contact, you have to be cheerfully persistent. Uh, you just have to, you have to uh, keep at it. You have to have regular contact. And it's, it, there's an aspect of judgment involved there. You want to make a request or leave a message or send an email and then give it some time depending upon the scheduling urgency, but then circle back around. Never betray any irritation, never betray any frustration. Yeah, we, we just keep saying we just cheerfully chase people. Uh, we're, and then at some point, uh, they, sim they know you're simply not going to give up on scheduling. And I think they appreciate that, the staff, the schedulers, the, uh, the, the key staff, the senior staff on the members, uh, uh, in the member's office, because those guys are extraordinarily busy, and uh, they know that when we circle back around, we're not going to be irritated, that we haven't heard from them, and it's another opportunity to get that connection made. Uh, the other thing that I, I thought of is uh, you can really you want to work really hard to triangulate your information. So when we were talking about the American Health Care Act with Senator Grassley, and we were uh, we were really facing the specter of capped federal funding for Medicaid. And you know many certainly in the, when the ACA legislation was in the House, the members kept saying, well, you know the states can make a decision about whether or not they will supplement Medicaid and continue to provide the whole array of services to all of the uh, participants. And, and we worked really hard to debunk that. We thought it was disingenuous and dishonest. We know most states are not in any position to pick up the additional Medicaid costs in their state uh, revenue general fund. And so we happen to know in Iowa, Senator Grassley's grandson, Pat Grassley, is a member of the uh, Iowa House of Representatives. And he happens to chair the Iowa House Budget Committee. And so during the course of the call, when we addressed the fact that states would have flexibility, we just said, well, Senator, you know very well in conversations with your grandson, Pat, that Iowa's had to cut $350 million out of their budget for next year, and they are in no position currently and probably not going forward to supplement these services. So if you pay attention and look for other information sources and a way to bring that back that can be very, very powerful in terms of making your point. All right, so we did have one question come in on the screen from Bonnie Brooks. Bonnie also has commented that her 23-year-old granddaughter was just hired by Congressman Estes of Kansas, and she has been telling us how much she's learning from, also how much the granddaughter is learning from uh, meeting with constituents. So having made that comment, Bonnie, Thank you for sharing that, Bonnie. That's great. Um, Bonnie is asking, how did you follow with Senator Grassley after your call? How did you follow up? Um, we did three things. Uh, the first thing we did is uh, we, had, uh, we had posted to uh, social media some pictures of the event. And, so, and actually, before we posted them, we just reached back. We knew it was going to be fine with them to do it, but we reached back to uh, – Karen Summer, and just said, hey, we'd like, to, we'd like to publicize this activity. Just wanted to clear that with you. Of course, they were enthusiastic about it. And so we posted uh, some of the pictures and uh, just uh, as a little thank you to Senator Grassley. Certainly we thanked him. This was a natural opportunity for us to have follow-up, though, because the, the debate kept coming and the evolution of uh, uh, the ACA repeal and replace uh, 